G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome to our webinar series. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to Elders past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded and this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And please don't forget to check out the Uluru Statement from the Heart website. If you haven't read the statement yet, um, make sure that you inform yourself ahead of the upcoming referendum on the Voice to Parliament. As you will know, if you've joined us for a long time, but for newcomers, days and times for our webinars do vary. So head on over to our website, australiainstitute.org.au for details of upcoming webinars. Uh, and just a few tips before we begin today to help today run smoothly. If you hover over the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A box where you can type in questions for our panel today. You should also be able to upvote other people's questions and leave comments on their questions. And you can leave comments in the chat, which is being moderated by Charlie on our staff. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic or we'll boot you out. <laughs> um, and lastly, a reminder, this is being recorded and it will go up on our website and YouTube channel later today. So I'm very excited about today's webinar. Kieran Pender and the Human Rights Law Centre have been unceasing champions of whistleblowing rights in general and individual whistleblowers who in recent years, as we all know, have been subject to prosecutions. David McBride, who exposed allegations of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan, could face up to 50 years in prison. Um, and in other words, as Kieran put it earlier this year, there's a very real prospect that the first Australians to be jailed over alleged war crimes in Afghanistan will be the whistleblower and not the perpetrators. So among the work done by the Human Rights Law Centre is a 12-step roadmap for federal law reform to better protect and empower whistleblowers, and they've recently launched the Whistleblower Project. That's what we're going to be talking about today, amongst other things, and I'm delighted to introduce our special guest for today, Kieran Pender, Senior Lawyer uh, in the Democratic Freedoms Team at the Human Rights Law Centre. Welcome, Kieran. Thanks for having me. Uh, and joining Kieran is Bill Brown, the Director of the Australia Institute's Democracy and Accountability Program. Welcome, Bill. Good to be here. Uh, Kieran, I'll start with you. First of all, for people um, who might be new to this topic, what is whistleblowing and why have you launched the Whistleblower Project? Well, thanks for having me. It's great to talk about such an important topic. Uh, whistleblowers make Australia a better place when they expose wrongdoing at work. So any of us tomorrow might go into work and see something that's wrong and call it out. Um, of course, depending on where you work, the magnitude of that um, may be more or less significant. But uh, any form of wrongdoing, illegality, impact on other people, impact on the environment uh, could and should be called out, whether you know to your boss, whether to uh, regulatory authorities and in certain circumstances to the media or to an MP or, or politician. Uh, because whistleblowing is so important, you know, if we think about what has changed Australia in past decades, what have been the scandals that have led to royal commissions, led to front pages, led to lawsuits, led to regulatory action, you know, the Banking Royal Commission, misconduct in Afghanistan, misogyny at the highest levels in institutions, uh, environmental degradation, climate inaction. So much wrongdoing has been called out by brave whistleblowers. But the problem is too many of them are suffering. So we have these laws that in theory protect and empower people to speak up, but they're not working. Uh, and so that's really why we've launched the Whistleblowing Project to help whistleblowers through a combination of legal support and advice uh, law reform, advocacy, and then just today we've launched a new report, The Cost of Courage, that sets out the roadmap for how we fix the system. Yeah, so that's a lot to unpack and get into, and I'm hoping we can get across a lot of the issues um, today. But you talked about law reform there in particular being one of the, the key things. So is that really been the impetus behind this project that we've got prosecutions of whistleblowers happening as we speak and the laws just aren't adequate and that's a piece of work that really needs to be done? Certainly. So I think the impetus for this work is we know the importance of whistleblowing and I think that's widely accepted now, which is a good step forward. Uh, we've got the systems on paper, but they're not working in practice. So we know there's empirical research that shows that um, you know, up to seven or eight in 10 whistleblowers suffer some form of retaliation at work. We have high profile cases of whistleblowing, whistleblowers being sacked for doing their job, uh, whistleblowers being sued for doing their job. And, and indeed, 
in some cases, these current prosecutions, Richard Boyle, Dave McBride, previously the likes of Bernard Caleri and Witness K, whistleblowers on trial for telling the truth. The law shouldn't be allowing that to happen. So for now, we've had over three decades laws introduced to protect and empower whistleblowers. They're not working. And so, you know, the, the, the inception of this project is really how do we fix that? Given how important whistleblowers are, how do we change the system so that the laws do work so that people can speak up and the wrongdoing is addressed and they can go about their lives and they're not on trial for telling the truth. They're not sacked for telling the truth. They're not being sued for telling the truth because otherwise we will live in a country where people can't speak up about wrongdoing and bad things will happen and there'll be no accountability for that. Or oh, bad things could happen that we could have prevented and no one was willing to speak up. Yeah, and, and yeah. RoboDebt is perhaps a really good example of that, where we've had, there were early whistleblowers who spoke up uh, and the RoboDebt Royal Commission report acknowledges that people spoke up internally, they weren't listened to, they didn't escalate it, other people perhaps didn't speak up because of the culture of fear. And so instead we have this unlawful system that continued that cost you know, billions of dollars in payouts, the untold human suffering, terribly some, uh, you know, uh, suicides that were linked to the, the the unlawful program, which could have been nipped in the bud if there was an effective system for people to speak up. And when whistleblowers come forward, what is it normally that they're seeking to do? Uh, most people who want to speak up want the wrongdoing addressed. You know, I've been fortunate to deal with a lot of brave whistleblowers in my time and, and no one wants to be a whistleblower. No one sort of self-identifies with that label. Most people just want the wrongdoing addressed. And so a really important part of our work is, is this isn't just a legal issue to be addressed. The law is important, but we also need to have the media landscape and the political landscape that when people speak up, they're listened to, the wrongdoing is called out, and then there's accountability. There's regulatory action. So yeah, people aren't kind of seeking the limelight or anything. Basically, they're just like, see something wrong and they want it addressed and it could end there if that's what companies or organisations or government departments did the right thing. Yeah, in a better world, that would be what happens. Yeah. Um, we're not there yet, but hopefully, uh, you know, this work will contribute to protecting and empowering whistleblowers. Yeah. And Bill, the Australia Institute has kind of looked into this. Mm. What do we know about public attitudes to whistleblowing? Yeah, so earlier this year, the Australia Institute did polling research in conjunction with the Human Rights Law Centre. Very grateful. <laughs> and uh, it was great to have your assistance too in, in formulating questions because it is a, a technical area as well as a one that people experience uh, in the public debate. And what you find is that there's real goodwill towards whistleblowers in Australia. Um, we see that three in four Australians, 76%, think whistleblowers make Australia a better place in general. People always ask, what about the 24%? <laughs> Most of that is actually people answering, don't know, not sure. It's only 6% who say that whistleblowers make the country worse. Um, and you actually get even better numbers when you ask about reforms to protect whistleblowers. So it's... Uh, is that um, 84% support stronger legal protections for whistleblowers, like those things that Kieran and the Human Rights Law Centre have been calling for. This year, we also took the opportunity to ask about some of those specific prosecutions of McBride and Boyle. And again, you get a majority of Australians saying that those prosecutions should be dropped. So I imagine it can feel quite lonely as a whistleblower, um, as if a lot of community sentiment or, or the, your, your employer, your co-workers might be ambivalent about what you're doing but in terms of the public there's real goodwill and support there yeah um I do want to pick up some of these prosecutions in particular I know you've worked a lot on um these cases but the two high profile cases that we've been talking about a lot recently are Richard Boyle and David McBride can you tell us a little bit more about their cases sure so Richard Boyle worked at the tax office. Uh, he worked in the debt recovery team where the tax office have people who try and recover unpaid tax debts. Uh, Richard Boyle became concerned about the really aggressive recovery tactics that were being used, sort of garnishy orders being issued to take money out of sort of small business accounts, individual taxpayers who were going through, for example, mental health challenges. Uh, rather than in a compassionate sort of considerate way, that was being done in a really arbitrary way. 
And he grew increasingly concerned. Richard spoke up internally as the system sort of provides. He thought he was following the steps. He spoke up internally. He spoke up to an oversight body, the tax uh, ombudsman. And then as a last resort, he went to the ABC and uh, Fairfax. He went to Adele Ferguson, the renowned investigative journalist who did some really important reporting on this and related issues that showed that the tax office was acting unethically in recovering tax debts. Now, that's led to independent inquiries from the Senate, from the tax ombudsman, from the small business and family enterprise ombudsman, all of which have, have basically agreed with Richard and said that this was wrong and it shouldn't have been happening. And so you think that is where the story should end. Um, unfortunately, after he did the interview with ABC, his house was raided and ever since, so that was five or six years ago, ever since Richard Boyle has been on trial facing jail time for speaking up about wrongdoing internally at the tax office. I mean, that just seems mind boggling to, I'm sure the average Australian that you would be punished effectively in that way for seeking to do the right thing. Um Explain to us a little bit the failures along the way there. Why is it that it ends up in prosecution when, or how is it, you know, what are the law reforms needed when someone like him can try and raise things internally, do all the right things, and it still ends in a prosecution? I think it's a symptom of the system being broken in respect to protecting whistleblowers. And, of course, the other case that I'll also mention, David McBride, uh, who was a, an army lawyer in Afghanistan, spoke up about uh, wrongdoing, again, spoke up internally, spoke up to oversight bodies, as a last resort went to the ABC, provided the documents that were the basis for the ABC's Afghan files reporting, which was some of the early really significant reporting of allegations of war crimes committed by Afghanistan. Again, we've had the Brereton inquiry, we've had the judgment in the Ben Robert Smith case, all this vindication of the wrongdoing that occurred, but again, it's the whistleblower on trial, not as yet the perpetrators. But both of these cases point to failures in our whistleblowing law. Unfortunately, the PID Act is incredibly technical. We've had a federal court judge say this law doesn't make sense basically to lawyers, let alone ordinary <laughs> members of the public service. In Richard's case, what's really problematic is he's on trial not for going to the media because the law provides avenues to speak up internally and then ultimately to the media, but he's on trial for the conduct the sort of evidence gathering in relation to his internal whistleblowing. So he argued that he was protected by whistleblowing law because he had done the right thing. A trial judge rejected that and said, because um, the criminal charges related to, you know, gathering documents, recording a conversation, taxpayer details sort of offences, that was sort of prior to the actual whistleblowing and therefore he wasn't protected. Now that case is on appeal. The Human Rights Law Centre intervened uh, as a friend of the court to try and argue for stronger whistleblower protections because if that stands, whistleblowers don't have any protection in you know, naturally needing to find the evidence of wrongdoing. Now we're not suggesting you go and sort of break into offices to get that evidence, but realistically, if you blow the whistle using nothing but what you've seen, you know, you won't have the same credibility. It's it's natural that you'll need to, you know, get some emails that you've seen, et cetera, and use that, that as the basis. And yet the trial judge decision says, no, none of that is protected. So I think both at the technical level, but then also just at the macro level, the fact that you've got two whistleblowers on trial right now in Australia undermines our system and sends a really chilling effect to, to other whistleblowers who might be thinking about speaking up. Yeah, and for people who are interested in some of the other prosecutions, the Australia Institute has spoken directly to Bernard Caleri and uh, former Timorese President um, Jose Ramos Horda about the prosecution of Bernard Caleri and, and Witness K. Um, just before we move on to some other things, is there anything you'd like to add about that case in particular? I found it really unusual that even the lawyer of the whistleblower was prosecuted in that case. Uh, the Kaliri case, the Witness K case, were really damaging to Australian democracy, not only because of the prosecution of whistleblowers for uh, significant misconduct towards a friendly neighbour in Timor-Leste, but the secrecy that was used to shroud those cases. Um, the good news is Bernard Cleary's trial stopped. One of the early things that the Attorney General did was drop that prosecution. Uh, the first time in Australian legal history that that 
step had been taken. So that was a really good thing. Unfortunately, as we said at the time, it's really a case of one down, two to go. He's dropped one case, but you've got these two other prosecutions ongoing. And so the good work of dropping the Caleri case is undermined by the fact that McBride and Boyle are still on trial. And, and, and as you said earlier, McBride's trial is in November in the ACT Supreme Court. The first person on trial for Australia's alleged war crimes in Afghanistan will be a whistleblower, not any of the perpetrators. That's really bad for our democracy. Yeah. And nonsensical in so many ways. Um, Bill, these prosecutions of whistleblowers, do they point to deeper problems in Australia in terms of, I guess, government overreach and, I guess, protection in general of freedom of speech? Mm. I think they do. And a couple of years ago, the Australia Institute looked at uh, different Um, attacks on free speech and limitations on free speech in Australia. That was in the context of raids on the homes of journalists and raids on the ABC. Um, But you actually find quite a pattern of ways that uh, typically government power is used to limit people from speaking out. That includes restrictions on what public servants can say, uh, including totally outside of their own work, um, as well as... uh, the threat or appearance of reprisals against people who might uh, speak out against government policy and then have the idea floated that that will limit their chance to receive government contracts in the future, for example. Um, But it goes back further to Australia has uh, rules on secondary boycotts, which have limited the power of workers to use their influence to stop wrongdoing um, with the companies that the companies that they work for are associated with. Um, And some form of those laws has existed for many decades with the current form introduced in the 1970s. I think the message from each of these ties back to Kieran's point about the the cultural side as well as the legal side, that if we let each of these exercises of soft power to limit people speaking out, each little legal encroachment on, say, the right of protesters to protest different industries, that accumulates to a culture that then makes it much harder for everyone to speak out. And that's a real concern. Yeah. I think that's a great point. Like I see this as a, a wider puzzle. There's whistleblowing, public sector free speech, a lack of human rights protections generally, transparency issues like the FOI inquiries on at the moment, I know, issues there, secrecy offences, more and more draconian secrecy offences, crackdown on protest, you know, and it paints collectively a picture, like a mosaic of increasing limitation on the ability of Australians to speak up about issues that are important to our democracy. And each of those in isolation is concerning, but it's the wider picture that makes it so alarming. Yeah. Um, you did mention before that um, when Mark Dreyfus became Attorney General, he um, dropped that prosecution of Caleri and um, he did also at the time, if I recall, um, flag problems with whistleblower laws. So what what does this look like now? What changes need to be made? How do other countries do it? What is the job ahead in terms of law? reform? Sure. Great question. So the Attorney General has committed to stronger whistleblowing law. We've seen an initial phase of really minor technical changes to the public sector whistleblowing law, the PID Act, that came in uh, in June. And what we haven't yet seen is the wider comprehensive reform. Now, the government has said it will do that. Um, It really needs to get on with that because it's so important and it needs to be done in a comprehensive manner. So at the moment, we have all of these different whistleblowing regimes for federal public servants, for the NDIS sector, the aged care sector, um, for the tax sector. Then you've got a general public sector, a private sector law that doesn't cover everyone, covers most people. And there's all these loopholes and patchworks. And then you've got every state and territory has their own public sector regime. That's a real mess. Um, it's so important. The government at the moment has said it, it's going to focus on the federal public sector law. We've been calling on it to take a bigger picture approach and say, look, let's get this right at a holistic level. Then our key priority is the establishment of a whistleblower protection authority. So I know the, the Australia Institute was really involved in pushing for a, a, a national anti-corruption commission. It's great. We've, we've got that now, but there's a missing piece of the puzzle. In the crossbench bill for a National Anti-Corruption Commission, there was a built-in whistleblowing body, a whistleblower protection commissioner. That didn't make the Labor bill that became law. So there's a missing piece of the puzzle. 
uh, we need a body in Australia to protect and empower whistleblowers, to have oversight, to be able to enforce these laws, to get involved in these cases. Because at the moment, whistleblowers have nowhere to turn. They don't have, you know, there's no equivalent of a Fair Work Ombudsman or a Human Rights Commission focused on whistleblowing laws. And you asked about what other countries are doing better. That's what they're doing. They're helping whistleblowers with the practical support, um, both through civil society. So the launch of our project aims to remedy that, but we can only do so much. What's really shifted the dial in other countries has been statutory independent government bodies dedicated to protecting whistleblowers. And you know that'll make the NAC more effective. It'll make the Ombudsman more effective. It'll make ASIC more effective when we have all of those functions focused on their own thing. And then we have a whistleblowing body helping whistleblowers bring information to all the regulators that will really help. Mm. Um, I did just want to touch on uh, this whistleblower project and I guess there might be people um, in the audience today who might have observed wrongdoing in the course of their employment, whether that's public sector or, or private. What would you recommend as the steps that they should take? And um, can you tell us a little bit more about the whistleblower project and, and how it might be able to help people who find themselves in that position? Well, they should go to our website, uh, <laughs> hrlc.org.au. We've got information there about the project, about some guidance on on blowing the whistle. Um, the hope of the project is to help people speak up safely and lawfully because we have these laws. They say on paper, you can speak up safely and lawfully. They're not working. And what we see is people need legal guidance to do that. Now, you know, we are a sm small community legal centre. We can't help everyone. We'll try and prioritise the most important cases and we'll try and refer where necessary. Um, we can't help national intelligence, national security intelligence whistleblowers. That's the one carve out the law. It, 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 all of this is really baked into the legal scheme. So the, the federal public sector and private sector whistleblowing laws say you can go to a lawyer to get help, but there's been very little of that support actually available or it's been really expensive. And so we're providing this on a pro bono basis to help people do the right thing speak up safely and lawfully, um, but we can't help spies. <laughs> um, bit of a carve out there. Uh, but um, I will go to questions from the audience very soon. So I can see I've got a couple of people in here with questions. A reminder that you can type those in and I can put them to Bill and to Kieran. And you can also upvote um, other people's questions that you would like answered and comment on them as well. So just a reminder, if you're putting a question in the chat, it's hard for me to see it. Do put it in the Q&A box there. Um, Bill, Kieran mentioned just before, I, and before we get to questions from the audience, about some other concerning um, issues that we've had around limiting freedom of speech. And I'm thinking here in particular of the wave of anti-protest laws that mm. we've seen around the country. Um, how concerning is that at kind of if we move down from the, the federal level to the state level that we're seeing those kinds of, of crackdowns on something as basic a freedom as the freedom to protest? Yeah, I think it's really concerning. We've seen in recent years, most states restrict protest rights further. Um, I think it's four out of the six have, have taken some measure to limit protests. A lot of those legal changes have seemed reactive. So a particular protest draws attention and suddenly the penalties for, say, a protest against forestry in one state attracts harsher penalties or um, there are ag-gag laws, so restrictions on animal rights activists exposing potential animal cruelty in farms that, again, comes out of a particular protest. Instead of taking a step back and asking, what are the settings that we want? What is uh, the right to protest, starting from those first principles, and how do we balance freedom of speech and a safe society? Um, I think it's it's really concerning in South Australia early this year, um, we saw what seemed to be legislation workshopped on talkback radio with uh, a bill introduced just a couple of days after it was first mooted um, by the media, um, passing with very little scrutiny. And that's really dangerous because without those parliamentary processes, we can't ensure that we've got the balance right. Mm. Um, do you have anything to add to that, Kieran? 
I think as part of this wider trend, it's a, a real concern. And I think partly it goes to the lack of an underlying human rights framework in Australia. You know, we're one of the few liberal democracies globally that doesn't have a, a federal human rights framework at the moment. We've only got human rights laws in, in Victoria, in Queensland and ACT. And there's currently a federal inquiry into a federal human rights charter. But but all of these laws are coming about because these issues of freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, freedom to protest and other important human rights are not being sort of fed into the legislative process. Now, obviously, that's going to be hard in any event when it passes in you know matter of minutes in, in South Australia, a particularly alarming case that my colleagues were involved in. But I do think it speaks to a wider context that we're making our laws in a way that isn't informed, as they should be, by our human rights framework. Australia will be a better place when government decisions are built on human rights guidance. Mm. Um, we're going to go to questions from the audience soon, and I can see we've got uh, close to 370 people on the line with us today. Thanks for joining us. Um, the first question I've got is from Paul Loring, and it's about Julian Assange. Um, and he asks, is Julian Assange considered to be a whistleblower? And if so, why is he seldom mentioned i'm not sure if that's by us today or by the media but perhaps we can address that now sure i mean i would consider julian assange as a publisher rather than a whistleblower he, he provided the platform for other people's whistleblowing uh julian assange's case is is deeply problematic and uh you know we're focused on the australian government and wrongdoing at the australian level and so we're not as active in in his advocacy but we have spoken out before and we've supported others who do important work you know, that case has a chilling effect on press freedom in the US and globally, and it's very concerning. Yeah, and Bill, as Kieran's mentioned, a really concerning chilling effect on on press freedom in particular mm. because as a publisher, I've never really understood how if you can prosecute Julian Assange, you're not also prosecuting like The Guardian and The New York Times and other people who use also published um, that kind of content um, do we know anything about what the Australian government is is doing or the latest on that Julian Assange case at the moment? It does seem like there's been some movement, but to be honest, I'm not sure how decisive it's been or, or where those discussions are up to. Um, but I agree, there's a real concern with um, how publishers are distinguished in general. Uh, we've seen that even with um, recent legislation about hate symbols carving out protections for professional journalists, but not necessarily for those citizen journalists that you might see, say, photographing a, a, a rally uh, in order to report negatively on a, a rally with hate symbols. Um, so I think it's important, particularly with a landscape these days where you've got more and more people publishing independently, that you do protect independent as well as those kind of um, mainstream media sources. Mm. Uh, the next question that I've got is from um, Glenn Schaefer, who says whistleblowers can often use social media uh, and other public platforms in an attempt to inform the public, yet defamation and even anti-terror laws can force social media companies to hand over details of account holders, even if they're anonymous. Um, should any reforms consider these issues alongside other whistleblower protections? Uh, I think what I'd say to that is um, at the moment, our whistleblowing framework does protect whistleblowers who speak up and in certain circumstances even speak up publicly. There are pr provisions for whistleblowers either after they've exhausted internal channels. So if they speak up internally then to an oversight body and nothing happens, they can go public. Or if there's a real emergency, if there's a threat to health and safety, they can go public straight away. So the protection already exists to go public. And then there's protections there from, for example, defamation. But I think that the, the, that said, we are seeing, unfortunately, defamation laws and, and other sort of slap suits being used not just to silence whistleblowers, but to silence uh, uh, civil society generally in Australia. Um, we've seen a real push, interestingly, in, in the EU and the UK following the Russian invasion of Ukraine. There was a recognition that Russian oligarchs had been using the legal system in the UK, in the EU, to silence civil society. And they've been, you know, what's been described as sort of slap law, laws to, to prevent the use of, of those lawsuits. We haven't seen that same discourse in Australia. And, and yet at the moment we have, for example, 
big mining companies, big fossil fuel companies seeking to take legal action against protesters. So mm. I think we're probably overdue for a conversation in Australia about how we better protect the rights of whistleblowers, but, but of all members of civil society, of society, to, to be engaging in that discourse without the threat of defamation lawsuits. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from a Ms. Price who says, what is the recourse for people who are sacked because of their public interest disclosures? So the law prohibits people being facing retaliation when they blow the whistle. Um, the law is not working as it's intended. So that's the real clear message out of this report that I mentioned, which is now available on our website. We looked at every whistleblown case in Australia ever. Uh, and under the two main federal laws for public sector and private sector, not a single case where a whistleblower has successfully proven they suffered retaliation. And across all of our whistleblowing laws, only one case of that occurring where someone received a measly $5,000 in compensation. So on paper, if you're sacked for blowing the whistle, you have rights, you should be able to vindicate them. Unfortunately, we know that's not working. And so that's why our report calls for a holistic framework of reform. We, we need law reform, we need sort of ecosystem reform, establishing a whistleblower protection commission, as I mentioned, and then we're going to hopefully play our part with the whistleblower project because it's really important that people who speak up aren't being sacked. And if they are, that these laws are working. So we're hoping, as I said, there hasn't been a single successful case. We need to change that. We need to begin moving the law in the right direction. So people who suffer for blowing the whistle can be vindicated and it will send the opposite of the current chilling message. It will send a, a constructive message of if you speak up, you'll be protected. And if as an employer, you take retaliatory action, you can expect to face you know, legal attempts to to ensure that these rights are being protected. Um, you've mentioned the report there and the, you've gone through, am I correct, every single whistleblowing case. Um, is there anything else that stuck out to you? That's kind of a, a long history of, of whistleblowers. Yeah, so we looked at about almost 80 cases, uh, judgments ac across Australia, every whistleblowing law in Australia, uh, over 20 since they first began to be introduced in, in the 19, early 1990s. And the lack of success was a major finding, a lack of access to legal support. So a lot of people in these cases were being self-represented. And so that suggests that the legal support isn't available to them. I think the issue with people, you know, the law presumes that, you know, you're protected. If you suffer retaliation, you've got to prove some connection between the whistleblowing and the retaliation. And unfortunately, I think the, the, the review shows that because the playing field is imbalanced, you know, employers have access to their records, to, you know, all sorts of reasons they can give to explain why they took reprisal action, whereas the whistleblower is often by themselves we're seeing the laws aren't working. And so we're beginning to see some of those schemes are, are shifting the onus. So it's up to employers to prove they didn't take retaliatory action, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. But not all of our laws have that. And I think we've got a long way to go. So it made for fairly unhappy reading that the law isn't working. Um, but we, you know, we're beginning to see change elsewhere. We've seen landmark whistleblowing laws introduced in the EU in recent years real change in the US. You know, I mentioned earlier when I got in, there was a case just recently in the US where uh, under their reward scheme, a whistleblower received, you know, 70 million US dollar reward for blowing the whistle on, on wrongdoing that had defrauded the US government of hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, I think that's a stark picture that in Australia, we prosecute whistleblowers. In the US, we pay them $70 million. Yeah. We've got to fix that system. So in Australia, we're protecting, empowering, encouraging whistleblowers, not firing them, not suing them, not sending them to jail. Mm. Um, I've got another question here that's about whistleblower protections needed at the state level. Can you tell us anything about that? So... States in Australia have long been at the forefront of whistleblowing reform. The first ever whistleblowing laws uh, were enacted in Queensland in the early 1990s after the Fitzgerald inquiry. And we were really pleased that Tony Fitzgerald, uh, KC, kindly launched our project last week because it was his report into corruption that first drew attention to the importance of whistleblowing and the need for protections for them. Um, since then, every state and territory in Australia has enacted laws that protect public sector whistleblowers in the state or territory. 
Um, they are a mixed bag. Um, we've seen some reform recently in New South Wales. There's new whistleblowing laws. Queensland's just had an independent review that's recommended a new whistleblowing law. Other states and territories, Tasmania, uh, for example, really lagging behind. So a mixed bag. Um, and that's why we think it's really important that we have consistency, not only at a federal level, but ideally a push towards some consistency at a state and territory level. You know, perhaps we'll never get one regime that covers everyone, but a push towards consistency is important. Mm. Uh, the next question is from Kiri, uh, who asks just for a simple definition of what a whistleblower is on a legal level. Uh, well, this is not legal advice, um, <laughs> but but the the law, I always like to think of it, the, the law defines a whistleblower um, in three ways, who the person is, what they're blowing the whistle on, and who they blew the whistle to. Um, so most laws uh, say you're a whistleblower if you're an employee or a contractor, or in some cases, even a volunteer or so on. So there's sort of who you are, then what's the wrongdoing, uh, the Federal whistleblowing law has all of these different categories, unlawful conduct, maladministration, threat to health and safety, threat to the environment. Private sector whistleblowers, it's just improper state of affairs. Again, unlawful conduct, all sorts of different things could fall within that. And then who you blow the whistle to. Is it to your boss? Is it to a sort of someone at a senior level in your organisation? Is it to ASIC? Is it to the ombudsman? Or in certain circumstances, to the media, to an MP? You've got to jump through those three hoops under whistleblowing law to be protected. And what we're seeing, unfortunately, is it's really technical. And so too often we see people who don't quite navigate that pathway, think they've blown the whistle lawfully and then find out they haven't. And that's why it's really important we give better support to whistleblowers so they can navigate that process. Mm. Um, I've got the next question here from Sibu Gatak. Um, Bill, is there a bipartisan stand on the issue of whistleblower protections and law reform in Australia? I think Kieran would know better than me, um, but it, I guess we've seen some promising signs from the, the Labor government with the dropping of the one prosecution. But uh, And before even the election, I think Mark Dreyfus was quite open that although he'd been the minister who introduced the PIT Act, um, it had problems that had clearly emerged. So Labor's kind of acknowledged that there are these limitations, but I'll throw over to Kieran for bipartisanship. Whistleblowing should be a bipartisan issue. Everyone should want accountability and transparency in this country. Um, unfortunately, we saw under the coalition government a sustained assault on whistleblower protections through the prosecutions and um, through a failure to fix the PIT Act. Um, conversely, though, the last government did fix private sector whistleblowing law. Um, so there's a mixed record. Uh, I'm optimistic um, there's support on the coalition side. Senator Paul Scar has long been a champion for whistleblowers. Mark Dreyfus, the Attorney General, uh, has long been a champion for whistleblowers. The Greens, the Crossbench are all committed to whistleblower protections. We just need to take that from uh, you know, lip service to reality and get these uh, reforms done, establish a whistleblower protection commissioner and see an end to these cases, which otherwise are having a real chilling effect on whistleblowing in Australia. Mm. Um, I've got another question that kind of goes to the process that that people undertake, which we've kind of touched on a couple of times. But Eddie asks, should whistleblowers try to raise issues privately and internally before going public? So the law typically um, prioritises that form of whistleblowing. Uh, but as I and so normally the typical pathway you'd speak up internally if nothing's done, you might go to the the oversight agency, the regulator, ASIC, the ombudsman or so on. And then as a last resort, you go public. But the laws do enable in certain circumstances you to bypass speaking up internally and going straight to a regulator or in certain circumstances going straight public. Mm. Um, again, this is not legal advice and I wouldn't <laughs> tell anyone to like the first thing you do to go to a journalist, that would be bad. Yeah. Um, but the law does recognise that sometimes you need those safety valves because the problem with speaking up internally is sometimes you're not listened to, sometimes you face retaliation, sometimes the people who are committing the wrongdoing want to cover it up. And so the law does recognise that. Um, unfortunately, we're just saying it's quite technical to do that and it's not working in practice as we see with these prosecutions. Mm. Uh, we've got another question here about access to justice. So you were talking about the fact that 
you're offering this pro bono because as you've outlined in this report, that is one of the, the barriers um, for, for whistleblowers. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about that um, and I guess the expense that's involved once these things kind of become subject to, to court matters? So lawyers are expensive. Um, legal advice is expensive. That's a real problem for whistleblowers getting the help they need. Uh, what we've seen in other countries where whistleblowing law has been more effective has been civil society filling that gap, providing the support that whistleblowers need. And so that's what we're hoping to do. We're hoping to provide that support on a pro bono basis so that people don't have to be out of pocket for doing the right thing. Um, interestingly, at our launch event last week, we had Jeff Morris, OAM, who blew the whistle on wrongdoing that sparked the Royal Commission into banking uh, and misconduct in the financial sector. And he he hears from a lot of prospective whistleblowers, given his status. And he says, you know, he doesn't sugarcoat the advice he gives, the challenges they'll face. And, you know, maybe one in a hundred still go public. And, and we were saying, well, what if we just change that to two in a hundred or three in a hundred. Now, sh ideally in a, in a better world, all hundred would be able to speak up. Obviously there's a lot of obstacles to getting there, but if we can just slowly help people speak up safely, lawfully in a way that they don't suffer retaliation, that could really shift the dial on accountability in all sorts of areas. Now, you know, one area I'm really passionate about is, is, is climate action and uh, addressing environmental degradation. One of the focuses of our project is going to be on climate and environment related whistleblowing. Again, an issue that's so important right now. How do we get people speaking up, people who are working in fossil fuel companies that are doing the wrong thing, who are working in government departments, in regulators that aren't doing their job, where there's wrongdoing going on, where there's maladministration, if we can empower them to speak up, that could be really game-changing for driving climate action and addressing environmental degradation. Mm. Um, Bill, I'll just come to you kind of off the back of that. Kieran's mm. mentioned there historically the roles of whistleblowers in getting things like royal commissions up. It does feel like um, we've had to have a lot of royal commissions lately to uncover wrongdoing on a whole range of fronts. We've had um, the banking royal commission, robo debt. Um, is this pointing to kind of some wider issues in the administration of government and public policy and and other things that we need to be concerned about? Yeah, I think that's right. That um, if if you kind of think about it as a difference between the the local and the general. Uh, each time we see a new crisis or failure of government emerging, a royal commission seems like a really good response. And, and you know, I've also called for royal commissions mm -hmm. precisely because they um, have wide ranging powers. They uh, are truth telling institutions. They have a, a gravity and significance to them that means that they're able to expose government wrongdoing. But if you take a step back and, and look at the ecosystem as a whole, I think the prevalence of royal commissions and the fact that we we feel like we need to turn to them is a symptom of the fact that we we've lost a certain trust in government. Um, and, and, you know, long term, decades long polling of Australian attitudes mm -hmm. to government reinforces this idea that trust in government is lower than it has been in the past. People are less confident that ministers and senior public servants are able to get the results that they need. Um, and so we turn increasingly to um, independent, alternative outsider sources for that guidance. Um, I think the the kind of reconciliation of those two is that we should have a really strong accountability branch um, holding the government to account. That's a mix of internal government positions like Auditors General, the National Anti-Corruption Commission, and so on, um, as well as the role of civil society groups, um, public interest journalism, um, and the Senate uh, as a, a parliamentary body that holds government to account. Um, if we see those strengthen, and if we see the political culture improve, then I think we could have fewer royal commissions because we'd have more confidence that government can fix these things for itself. Um, anything you'd like to add to that, Kieran? I, I totally agree with what Bill said. I, I think the role of the Senate and Parliament has been really interesting. 
we're seeing, particularly with a resurgent crossbench, whistleblowers are going to our MPs and senators who are using parliamentary privilege to expose wrongdoing. We've seen Andrew Wilkie, a long-term proponent of that, more recently, like the likes of Zoe Daniels, Senator David Pocock. The Parliament and the Senate have incredible powers, and some of those powers go to protecting people who give it information, protecting whistleblowers. But to me, that represents a failure of all of our other structures. That should be a last resort, not a first resort. But at the moment, people are having to go to MPs and senators because none of the rest of the system is working. Um, but I totally agree. We've got to get that integrity landscape right. And then you know, we'll always have a need for people to speak up. And in an ideal world, they won't suffer harm as a result. The issue will be addressed if we have a functioning ecosystem that enables that. Um, I think that was why it was so important um, and that there were stronger whistleblower protections and a whistleblower protection body as part of the National Anti-Corruption Commission, which unfortunately we don't yet have. And the government, you know, there's been some initial reform and is committed to more. But how will the NAC do its job effectively if people aren't confident and empowered to go to it? And mm. they don't at the moment because... The government chose not to include the Whistleblower Protection Commission that was in the crossbench bill that had been recommended. Um, you know, this is not a novel idea. It, 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 as early as the early 1990s, there was a recommendation by a parliamentary committee report to establish a whistleblowing body. Again, a bipartisan report in 2017. Labor took the idea to the 2019 election. So none of this is novel. It's been done elsewhere. It's a good idea whose time has come. It wasn't included in the NAC. I think it's so important that the government get on with establishing a whistleblower protection body to fit into that ecosystem because that will make it easier for all of the other bits of the ecosystem to function. Mm. And just sticking with royal commissions, um, obviously they're not also just looking into governments but also wrongdoing in the private sector, like in the in the banking royal commission, and it does strike me as part of that ecosystem the importance of regulators as well who are supposed to be overseeing and looking into, you know, complaints of wrongdoing and making sure everyone's doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, Kieran, uh, there's a couple of people asking where they can find uh, the Cost of Courage report and about the Whistleblower Project. Can you just tell us again the the website for the Human Rights Law Centre? On our website, hrlc.org.au. Um, I've got another couple of questions in here around some of the specific prosecutions of um uh, David McBride and a few follow-up questions around the exemption for spies and things like that. So one here is on his case and asking that uh, his legal team were forced to abandon their public interest defence partly because of claimed national security risks and partially because of foreign parties. Can you tell us, do you know a little bit more about that? Yeah, one of the really uh, concerning aspects of the McBride case was that David McBride was seeking to rely on the Public Interest Disclosure Act, the PID Act, to protect himself from uh, the prosecution, to say that he was immune from the prosecution. And um, so, uh, you know, this was last October. We we're all in court. It was day one of his, of his defence hearing saying, I'm immune because I blew the whistle in accordance with these laws. His barrister gets up, Brett Walker, very senior Australian barrister, and unfortunately, at the last minute, the government had made uh, national security public interest immunity claims over parts of uh, McBride's case, and so they had to withdraw the case. And that was a really alarming uh, misuse of uh, secrecy provisions, given that the secrecy framework already operated over that case. Um, we called that out at the time. We've continued to call that out. Um, secrecy over court proceedings is is uh, problematic generally. Um, and of course, if if that hearing had been held in secret, we would have been calling that out in itself. But surely having some of that hearing in secret would have been preferable to him having to withdraw that case. And so the use of that mechanism, you know, there's obviously some technical legal detail I won't go into, um, but that was really concerning because it now means he goes on trial before a jury in November, not having the benefit of that whistleblowing defence. That's been withdrawn. His argument that he was doing the right thing under law, he can't use anymore. He'll face a jury. There's a prospect of jail time. Um, how much jail time uh, do you know? 
some of the offenses he's charged with are really severe. So potentially years in jail, which again, I think just underscores how problematic these prosecutions are. People who've exposed wrongdoing, no one doubts that the wrongdoing they exposed was true. They've been vindicated. Both Richard Boyle and David McBride have been vindicated by independent investigations. And yet they're the people on trial, not the wrongdoers of the misconduct they expose. Mm. Um, there's a question in here about not just assuming that all whistleblowers are telling the truth. Um, how is that generally assessed and weighing up, um, you know, the veracity of their of their claims? How does that normally work? Uh, of course, um, uh, you know, people can misunderstand what they're seeing in front of them. People can sort of have a mis perceptions. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone who speaks up necessarily is telling the truth, but what's important is that they have the option to speak up and then for that truth to be assessed. Uh, most of the whistleblowing laws don't require what you speak up about to be actually true for you to be protected, just that you had a reasonable belief. So of course, you know, if you're vexatious, you, know, you might not be protected, but yep. the vast, vast majority of whistleblowers are doing the right thing. They think they've seen something wrong as long as that's a reasonable belief, they're protected. And then it's up to you know their organisation or the regulator or ultimately the public to decide if that's the case. Mm. Um, Bill, uh, putting this in the context of kind of wider law reforms and a real, I guess, renewed focus on accountability and transparency that kind of came out of the last election where integrity issues were such a huge thing. Do you think there's been a real resurgence in the public's interest in these issues that will hopefully force a bit more change through the parliament? I think that's right. We've seen, or in fact, I think we uh, described the 2022 election as the integrity election and conducted polling that showed that people reported uh, either that they were as concerned about integrity as at the previous election or a large chunk were more concerned. So things that emerged that made them more worried about how Australia was being governed, the transparency of the government and so on. Um, and since then, with, for example, the Morrison Secret Ministries scandal, we've seen even more concern about how Australia is governed and, and who governs it. That was really manifested with the National Anti-Corruption Commission, um, with at least this initial tranche of reforms for whistleblowing and, and hopefully an appetite for more. Um, there's also the remaking of the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal, the AAT, um, which uh, Australia Institute research shown had been subject to political appointments at an escalating level. So there's a lot of areas um, where there's increased public focus. And I think it's reassuring too that even some of these more technical areas remain of media interest, remain of public interest. Uh, there were initial attempts, for example, to dismiss the secret ministries scandal uh, as technical or, or inside baseball, uh, and the public didn't buy that mm. quite rightly. Um, and we're seeing that in a whole bunch of areas. Mm. And I feel like we're also seeing... Um, with the rise of independence, uh, a little bit of a return to um, MPs from major parties being willing to cross the floor and those kinds of things um, as well, perhaps hopefully signs of uh, healthy democracy within the parliament <laughs> itself. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. We're going to have to wrap it up there. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone's questions, but thank you so much for joining us, Kieran Pender and Bill Brown today. Thank you all of us for joining us. Don't forget to head on over to australiainstitute.org.au. We've got some really exciting webinars coming up, including uh, with Isabella Weber, the world-renowned economist who is looking at the role of corporate profits in rising inflation and how governments have been thinking about inflation wrong. Uh, that's next week and you can register now for that. It is free to the public, but registration is essential. Don't forget to follow our Follow the Money podcast, which you can find wherever you normally listen to podcasts, where we explain big economic issues in plain English. And uh, don't forget to sign up to our newsletter at the Australia Institute as well. You can find all those things on our website at australiainstitute.org.au. And uh, for all of the reports and the whistleblower project that Kieran has mentioned today, that's hrlc.org.au. Is that right? Thank you so much for joining us. We'll hope to see you uh, next week. Take care. Bye-bye. 
Thanks for watching. If you'd like to keep up to date with all our latest research and work, sign up to our newsletter. Delivered every fortnight, it includes behind the scenes updates from Richard Dennis, an exclusive cartoon from Judy Horacek, details for our upcoming events and webinars, as well as explainers, graphs, and not to mention the latest cutting edge research and analysis from the team here on the key issues that are facing Australia. Click the button on your screen to check it out.